Hello, good evening and welcome to News 360 Live from our news hub here at Adesawa in Kandakra. My name is Pa Kwesiasare. I'm Natalie Force. Let's take a look at the top stories this evening. News 360 Headlines is brought to you by Deluxe Paint, Piccadilly Biscuits and My Life Insurance. Abu Sokai Spare Parts Dealers Association gives government a two-week ultimatum to clamp down on foreigners engaged in petty retail business. Minority in Parliament accuse President Akufuado of peddling untruths about inheriting a $5.2 billion energy debt in his interaction with Ghanaians in Canada. In business tonight, 19,000 customers of the insolvent microfinance companies have been paid. Ahead in sports, 32nd edition of Continental Football Tournament, AFCON, in Egypt, less than 24 hours away. And elsewhere on the far in front, thousands of opposition supporters have taken to the streets of several cities in Malawi to protest against last month's re-election of President Peter Mutarika. So with us here on News 360, we've got the details of these and much more news. As always, remember you could watch us all across the world. It's 3news.com and TV3 Ghana on Facebook. Let's get started with our very first story this evening. As the Abusokang Spare Parts Dealers Association has issued a two-week ultimatum to government to rid foreigners of petty retail business. The association says it is disappointed in the Ghana Investments Promotion Center, GIPC, and government for failing to address the issue, which has resulted in protest by their counterparts at the Swami Magazine in Kumasi. The GIPC Act 865 states that a person who is not a citizen or an enterprise which is not wholly owned by citizens shall not invest or participate in petty retail business. Its enforcement has been contentious between local and foreign traders. Governments last year constituted a tax force to deal with the issue which did not yield the desired results. Some spare parts dealers at Swami Magazine in Kumasi have been protesting the infiltration of foreign traders in their business. Their counterparts in Accra, the Abusokai Spare Parts Dealers Association, says they blame the situation on failure of government to enforce the GIPC Act 865. When you see institutional failure, when, when certain people who need to react are not doing so, this is the results that you get. What is GIPC? Who is supposed to implement that law? What are they doing? What are the police doing? What are the foreign, uh, foreign affairs ministry doing? What is uh, immigration doing about this? What, is the, what are the customs doing about the, the routes that these people have been using to bring in goods into our country at cheaper price? And, and you, you see, there are a lot of institutional, the institutions, some of them are not helping. They contend the influx of foreign nationals in their business is negatively affecting them. You sit here and you are selling papers. There is a foreigner who is also operating the same shop. He buys, because they have access to cheaper capital, he buys five motorbikes and give it to employers. They are going around the fitting shops where the people will come from to your shop to come and buy. They will go and ask him, what do you need today? Do you have a car which needs shocks do you have a car and then they'll come and take it from the shop and go and give it to the person there don't they think our business are being collapsed the public relations officer of the association francis anum says members expect a response from government in two weeks but the association requested government to deal with the menace of foreigners infiltrating into our retail the emphasis should be on retail business because per the gipc law if you want to retail, you should be a foreigner. And so we spoke and made our grievances known to the Ghanaian that we want our businesses protected. The association has over 15,000 members. 
In other news, the Ashanti Regional Branch of the Ghana Union of Traders Association warns the law banning foreigners from engaging in petty retail business enforced. According to the association, the continuous engagement of Nigerians and other nationals in retail activities is pushing the locals out of business. Here's a report by Beatrice Pilgabra. Calm has returned to Swami Light Industrial Area in Komasi after a protest by some aggrieved youth over the involvement of Nigerians in retail business. A joint police-military team, however, continues to patrol the Swagat area where protests were held. The Nigerian traders had still not opened their shops despite the assurance from the police to give them protection. The Ashanti Regional Chairman of Guta, Anthony Opong, expressed disappointment over the lack of enforcement of the law. The GRPC at ACH5 states that retail business is reserved for Ghanaians, the indigenous and indigenous alone. They shouldn't do the retail business. They, uh, they are hiding behind the ECOWAS protocol. The ECOWAS protocol states that they should come here for nine, three months, 90 days. You do your business, you're trading, then you go back to your country. If you want to stay in Ghana and do business here, you apply to the authorities, first to the Immigration, the Ghana Investment Promotion Council, and the Ghana Revenue Authority. They register you, they give you the appropriate documents, and then you stay here and do your business. None of them have all that we are talking about. So they are perpetuating illegality and flouting our laws with impunity. It's just unfortunate that authorities can't stand up to them. He cautioned against any attack of foreigners doing business and entreated government to address the problem. Well, quite a controversial issue that's come up within the last few days. We're joined uh, on the phone lines by Dr. Kofi Linse. He's an economist and legal practitioner. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your time and good to have you on the program. So, first of all, can you clarify if there is any confusion with regards to the ECOWAS Trade Treaty and, and Ghanaian laws like the GIPC Law 865? Yes, exactly. You see, the GIPC law makes it clear that foreigners, and by foreigners means anybody who is not a Ghanaian, is not and uh, 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 should not get into the retail trade. But Echo, but ECOWAS protocol allows members of the uh, ECOWAS region to be treated like any other member. I.e., Nigerians ought to be treated as Ghanaians, just like. Ghanaians also have to be treated equally with Nigerians. So in that sense, Nigerians can get into the retail trade. So this is an issue which there's a question mark that needs to be clarified properly diplomatically. That, that, that is really some confusing uh, matter there. So what's the way in dealing with this matter? What's the way forward, really? Now, you see, when you have a treaty or you have a protocol for which there is a question mark on. There is a court. There are processes on which these issues can be clarified. This matter has come up. So my view is that it needs to be taken up and discussed properly and looked at it diplomatically properly with the ECOWAS. You see, the only problem is that within the ECOWAS, we do not, within the ECOWAS, we, don't, we do not have a separate ECOWAS court. The court in Nigeria is the one that actually acts the ECOWAS court. So that is then a question mark. But I think this is an issue that needs to be looked at, that there is a potential conflict between the GIPC law and the ECOWAS protocols and how members of the ECOWAS region need to be treated by one another. Well, one other issue that has come up is the way the traders and Kumasi have gone about uh, enforcing this. They've gone into the shops of uh, supposed Nigerians and are forcibly closing down their shops. Uh, do you think the trade minister should come out to, you know, let matters lie with regards to how this matter should be dealt with? Well, it will be helpful. I mean, the trade minister can answer something. I believe they had some discussions with the Nigerian government at some point. But you see, at some point, too, I also note that the Nigerians themselves unilaterally took certain decisions against uh, Ghanaians or groups from Ghana, which is against the ECOWAS protocol itself, you know, as they are now. So this is an issue that needs to be clarified so that if in, indeed one country is going to actually abide by the protocols, then all countries need to abide by the protocols equally. Otherwise, it, it would, you know, lead to potential conflict and potential problems as we have now.
Um, you've already talked about the conflict between what the ECOWAS law says and what the GIPC also says. I need to take your own perspectives on the matter, uh, considering also that uh, we're having uh, the Intercontinental Free Trade Agreement, which is going to be uh, pretty, pretty soon signed by uh, all 42 member countries. What is your own view? Uh, do you think that, you know, we should allow foreigners, African, you know, to be able to operate within the retail market reserved for Ghanaians? You see, my own view is that in th these matters are matters that are negotiated between countries. One country ought not to allow another country to be able to do certain things if they do not have reciprocal treatment in that other country, you know, in that other country. So this is something that needs to be discussed. I, if I'm treating my, you, you know, your citizens, you know, in a certain way, you ought to treat my citizens in the same way. This is the idea behind the ECOWAS protocol. But unfortunately, the ECOWAS treaty and the protocols are not actually enforced or abided by as they should. So given that these problems are coming up, it is an issue that I think can be held by until this discussion is properly sorted out. Because, you know, on the face of it and on the paper as it is, you know, ECOWAS nationals ought to be treated in the same way as Ghanaians. But if Nigerians do not allow Ghanaians to be treated the same way as they are in Nigeria, why should Ghana also treat Nigerians that way, uh, well, you know, as equal in Ghana? So it's something that needs to be sorted out by, the, you know, by both countries. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Linsa, for your th time. Uh, Dr. Linsa is an economist helping us to uh, do some analysis on the latest, uh, you know, disturbances uh, in Kumasi between uh, Ghanaians and uh, Nigerian traders there. Natalie? C certainly, Park, we see more on that issue to come forth in the coming days. But let's head to Parliament now as the minority has accused President Akufuadu of peddling untruths about the energy sector debts in his interaction with Ghanaians in Canada. The NDC MPs say claims by the President that his administration inherited a $5.2 billion energy debt is false. The President has sought to mislead the public about the exact state of affairs in the sector. The President has often made inaccurate claims about the debt in the energy sector in a bid to conceal the true state of affairs. One of these inaccurate claims was his recent visit to Toronto, where he said that his government inherited $5.2 billion debt in Ghana's energy sector from the previous Mahama-led National Democratic Congress administration. The minority said it is bent on exposing government. The minority does not only find this statement as inaccurate, but also as an attempt by the president to shake responsibilities from the incompetent he has displayed in the management of the country's energy sector. The energy sector has been plagued with huge debts that plunged the country into darkness in recent past. As at the end of 2016, the energy sector there was approximately $2.2 billion. At the exit of President John Dramani Mahama, the $2.2 billion was certified and agreed to be settled within three to five years, starting from 2016. To clear the accumulating debt, the Energy Sector Levies Act was promulgated. The minority in Parliament expect President Nana Akufuado to take responsibility and address the liquidity operational challenges in the country energy sector instead of carrying on with the nauseating blame game. The president must show clearly how he intend to revive the entities like the oil refinery and then bust, which were fully operational when the former president John Dramani Mama handed over to him in January 2017. The MPs want government to account for the disbursement of funds from ESLA. A reminder, you're still watching News 360 live from our news hub here at Adesawa in Kanda, Accra. If you just joined us, uh, you can share with us your views, comments and suggestions on any of our top stories this hour. Uh, you can join us uh, on Facebook or on Twitter. Our handle is TV3GH. We're also streaming live on Facebook. Now, let's go to the courts now. And the Jabin, Jabin District Court has ordered prosecutors in the trial of dancehall artist Livingstone, H.A. Uh, 
popularly known as Stone Boy and Charles Niyama men's are popularly called Shatawale to file all the documents they intend to rely on before July 15. This was after the prosecution led by Superintendent Emilia Asante told the court that they have filed some of the documents and needed time to file the rest. According to the lead prosecutor, Superintendent Emilia Asante, the state intends to call four prosecution witnesses for the trial of the two musicians. She added they have already filed the witness statement, an exhibit of three, and was yet to file that of the last witness. Shatawale is facing a charge of offensive conduct conducive to breach, to breach of peace, while Stoneboy has been charged and display of a firearm in public without permission. Stone Boy and Shatawali were hauled before the court and earlier on May 22 pleaded not guilty to the charges they are facing over their involvement in the disturbances that marred the Vodafone Ghana Music Award. The two were granted bail in the sum of 50,000 cities with one surety each. The two musicians were present in court. They were cautioned to be of good behavior while the case is ongoing. The case has been adjourned to July 16 for hearing to continue. Selom Amenya, TV3 News, Accra. Let's return to Parliament as the minority leader is pushing for female MPs from his side to be elected unopposed in his party's primaries. Haruna Idrisu says the leadership of Parliament is worried about the attrition rates in the House but hopes that his position is accepted by leadership of his party. Reacting to a University of Ghana survey on MPs, the leaders of both sides of the House were united. Harun Idrisu called for the amendment of the 1992 constitution to allow for proportional representation of women. Reiterating his point in finding ways to keep women's participation in Ghana's democracy. It is not good for our parliamentary democracy watching the attrition rate of members of parliament. And this house, denied of experience, will not be a better house in delivering to the people of Ghana a stronger, transparent, and accountable uh, parliament. So if I have my way, none of the NDC female MPs will be subjected to parliamentary primaries. How I wish within uh, democratic culture I could protect and support them. But more importantly, we need research on that. How do we encourage, protect, and increase female participation in our democracy? The answer as I have heard him and heard myself, lies in amending the 1992 constitution. Leadership of parliament is agitated over the University of Ghana's survey, predicting that over 180 lawmakers will lose their seats in the 2020 parliamentary elections. A survey, the speaker, Professor Michael Quay, has slammed, accusing the researchers of inciting the electorate against MPs. The majority leader, Oseche Mensa Bunsu, criticize the poll. We get it wrong, but it's for the University of Ghana to straighten the path and not follow the crooked path. Otherwise, we'll never be able to straighten the path for all of us. And that is why I think that we should have, um, you know, a joint stock company. They should have a joint stock company with NCCE to really define the remit of members of parliament. And on our MTN video report today, our citizen journalist Richard Atabuafo, uh, Bafo, I beg your pardon, highlights the poor state of road at Joaboso District in the western region. My name is Richmond Atabafo, reporting from Nkatia. So this is a car from Asangwe, so heading towards Debiso. And the situation of the road is so bad that the car cannot come. Just a hill which he needs, it needs a little effort. This is the situation of the road. So, so abysmal, so bad that the car cannot move. I am at a bar for Richmond.
uh, just like at top bar for Richard. You can also send your uh, video report via WhatsApp on 055 143 That's 055 143 but do stay with us here on News 360. We've got business news coming up shortly. Welcome back to News 360. Let's delve into the business segment this evening, starting off with 19,000 customers of the insolvent microfinance companies who've been paid. A deputy governor of the central bank, LC Ado Awaji, made the disclosure on the sidelines of the 9th AGM of the Association of All Savings and Loans Companies in Accra. The Bank of Ghana revoked the licenses of 347 insolvent microfinance companies. The shutdown took effect from May 31. The licenses of 192 of them were revoked in addition to that of another 155, which had ceased operations. A deputy governor of the central bank, Elsie Adu Awaji, indicated the process of paying customers is on course. As we speak, about 19,000 depositors have already been paid uh, because they have, they have lodged their claims and have uh, proven their claims and so the validator has been the uh, receiver has been able to validate these claims and then has instructed CBG Consolidated Bank Ghana to make these payments and these payments have been made either by way of uh, bank transfers or by mobile money. The cost of liquidating the seven troubled banks had reached almost 13 billion cities World Bank report says Ghana needs another $1 billion, an equivalent of 5.5 billion cities, to complete the financial sector cleanup. It's a bit, a bit difficult to have certainty before you've actually gone in to close our institutions. But based on the estimates that we have and based on new information we get every day, um, we review these numbers and we continue to dialogue with government with a view to um, understanding just what, sp what fiscal space government itself has to be able to support this. And so whatever amount um, becomes the number in the end will be a combination of our best estimates on what um, these claims of depositors are, as well as how, government it's, how much government itself is able to provide for the cleanup exercise. The deputy governor hinted the finance ministry has launched a document which targets 75% financial inclusion by the end of 2020. We're doing this by ensuring that the institutions that we license to offer financial services are themselves safe and sound and sustainable. In addition to that, we um, continue to engage in public education and in particularly to uh, improve financial literacy as well as um, making them understand the range of products and services that are available for them within the financial sector. Meanwhile, Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Elsie Ado Awaji, further says no decision has been taken on raising the minimum capital for savings and loans companies. Speaking in Accra at the ninth annual general meeting of the Association of All Savings and Loans Companies, she assured any such move will be in consultation with the association. The minimum capital requirement is to ensure solvency and aligning financial institutions' capital base closely with macroeconomic realities. The minimum capital requirement for savings and loans companies currently is 15 million cities. We will take such a decision after consultation with stakeholders, including the institutions themselves in the sector. And as of now, we haven't increased the capital and we have not put out a proposal. And so I believe that if at a certain point in time we believe that's the way forward, we would do that in consultation with the stakeholders. I talked about repositioning the sector, and there are many options for repositioning the sector. If we believe that increasing the minimum capital is one such option, we would engage with the stakeholders and take a decision on that. Chairman of Association of All Savings and Loans Companies, GASAC, Kwekudu Habechi, underscored the importance of good corporate governance. We know that Bank of Ghana is continuing its reform process. We are all expecting to see the central bank complete the exercise very soon, especially within our sector. 
We use this opportunity to admonish the public, especially the depositors, to remain calm, since it has been proven over the period by the actions and inactions of the central bank and the government that the protection of the depositor is of prime concern. Executive Secretary of Gasak, Chenebu Akuduyabuachi, threw more light on the relationship between the association and the central bank. We believe that the central bank, um, uh, mentioning that they will continue to engage, they will be engaging with players so that we ensure that whatever capital that they announce will be in the interest of, one, the depositors, and two, the interest of uh, the economy, three, the interest of even the businesses themselves. And so we are not sure that the central bank will just bring any capital that is unreasonable. And we will want to uh, encourage them to continue the uh, engagement. On to some other business news this evening. Economist and head of finance department at the University of Ghana, Professor Gottfried Bokbin, has charged government to re-examine Ghana's debt dynamics to avoid a return to another IMF bailout. As an Imani lecturer in Accra, he argued that priority spending has been compromised, leading to unbalanced economic growth due to high debt servicing. Ghana joined the International Monetary Fund, IMF, in 1957. Since then, it has sought economic bailouts 16 times. The country's economic growth has picked up 8.5%, the fastest in five years. Nonetheless, with an election year imminent, economist Professor Bookpin is concerned about the country's ability to manage debt projected to inch up to 62% by end 2019. When you look at the statistics, it means that every three years and a few months or so since independence, or averagely every four years, we have had to go to the IMF. We have been there 16 times, and I'm sure our next visit is as close as next year's election. He explained the country risks crowding out priority spending in key areas of the economy, which is a recipe for unbalanced growth and deteriorating infrastructure. It has been difficult for us as a country to achieve sustainable physical consolidation over a long period. This is crowding our priority spending. Every time our revenue envelope does not respond to the policy measures, what gets sacrificed is how much we intend to spend on capital or expenditure. Any country that is not making sufficient provision towards capital spending it has either concluded it doesn't have a future or it doesn't intend to take advantage of that. He charged the Ghana Revenue Authority, GRE, to seal revenue leakages in order to reach its average potential of an extra 8%. Our tax potential is very, very huge. The calculation is giving us that we can actually do additional revenue mobilization of 89 billion seats because that is our potential. And the next stage is to convert our potential into what? Into actual. The Economist urged government to allow the central bank autonomy to promote fiscal discipline and recommended an adherence to the tenets of the fiscal responsibility law to avoid escalating the debt situation. And that's all the business news you've got for you this evening on News 360. But there's a lot more business news available on our website. It's 3news.com. So that's your News 360. We've got sports news coming up shortly. Hello, good evening, and let's do some sports here on News 360. My name is Theo Nyer, and thanks for joining me. Now, the Africa Cup of Nations 2019 is only a day away from launching off as all eyes turn to Cairo, Egypt, for the 32nd edition of the Continental Football Tournament. Now, here's a preview ahead of the big African football showpiece. On Friday, the countdown to the AFCON 2019 officially ends. Africa will witness another spectacle of football played by the best the continent can pull together. In the stands, familiar faces in African football will be witnessed. Fans will be thrown into hysteria when the balls roll into the net. We may see new celebrations from the stars on show and one alluring possibility is we could witness the birth of new talents on the biggest stage of African football. The likes of Sadio Mane, 
and Africa's highest goal scorer at the World Cup at Samoajan will have to wait for their turn to kick the ball as Mohamed Salah and his Egypt side open the tournament with a clash against Zimbabwe on Friday. As Egypt hosts the AFCON for a record fifth time, there could be a familiar name on the trophy if they win it. It will be their eighth win, another record for the Faroes. Burundi, Madagascar and Mauritania will be making their maiden appearances in the tournament in 2019. For the first time, the tournament will see 24 teams paraded in one country for a month and with gasping hope around the continent, participating countries will attempt to annex the trophy from the hands of the serial winning hosts. And oh, lest we forget, there will be VAR implementation during the AFCON 2019, another first. The scales, tricks, goals and wild celebrations will be live on TV3 and other stations in the Media General Group. Let the games begin. Now let's still stay on the African continent because the Confederation of African Football has decided to install a new decision in this year's Africa Cup of Nations. CAF confirmed matches will be stopped on the 30th and 75th minutes for three minutes of water breaks. The decision is due to uh, fairly high temperatures in Egypt during the time the AFCON will be played. CAF pointed out the temperature ranges between 35 and 38 degrees coupled with humidity of uh, range 40 to 60 percent and uh, posed threats to the health of players who will be representing the Biennale. African events. Water breaks were also used in the 2018 FIFA World Cup in Russia and it will be used in the Africa Cup this year. Remember, the Africa Cup of Nations is just a day away, just about 24 hours from kickoff, and still we focus on there. Now we are the 11th hour of the AFCON 2019, and the Black Stars are firming up preparations in their base, Dubai. Chris Pi and his players will leave Dubai on Friday and make a straight trip to Egypt with the tournament starting on the same day. The opening game of the tournament will be played between host Egypt and Zimbabwe, while Ghana will have to wait to play Benin on Tuesday. Apia has a full complement of his squad at the end of his training camping in Dubai. Now, as Ghana prepares vigorously for the tournament, uh, we'll be counting on every single member of the contingent traveling to Egypt for the next few weeks if we must win the trophy for the first time since 1982. Andy Adam says he hopes he will play a key role in Ghana's chase for a fifth Africa Cup of Nations. Yes, it, it feels um, an honour and, and a pleasure. Obviously, um, two years ago, I managed to go to the AFCON, which was a very good experience. I managed to play twice and also gained a lot of experience from a lot of the people that was there. So it's, it's good for me to um, hopefully be, be heading there again. Well, two years ago, it was very new. It was my first time, so I didn't know the, uh, the dynamics of it all. I'll have a little bit more experience and I'll know the whereabouts and, and how things work and I think it can um, help me in good stead. This year I think I, I only missed one game, so um, so yeah, it was a very tough, gruelling season but then again I, I gained a lot of experience playing so many games. So I think this season, even though um, we did not finish at a strong, a strong point in the table, um, I did put in a lot of, a lot of good performances. So. Hopefully, I think that's that's how I'm, I, I was recognised. Well, you know, um, Afu is a is a really really good player, and um, even here at the camp, there's still good fullbacks that that are here. So the competition is really good, and if I'm selected, then you know I'll I'll try and take it with um, with full effect. 
Andy Adam, a Black Star defender. Now, ahead of the big kickoff for the 2019 Africa Cup of Nations in Egypt, there are concerns over how ready the organizers are in terms of security. Now, the apprehension has been varied, coming from highly placed football people and fans as well. Julie Bewa has been speaking to France 98 World Cup winner Marcel Desailly, who has also called for a ragged security detail. Despite assurances from CAF and the local organizing committee, Egypt's very own public security record in recent times has done little to assuage the fears of the footballing world. In the last few weeks alone, there has been an attack on a bus carrying a dozen South African tourists while militant groups opposed to the regime of President Fatah al-Sisi continue to foment trouble. All these have placed a dark cloud over a country that already battles a fragile environment image and that, according to former French national team captain Massoud Desailly, is worrying. Desailly warns that nothing should be left to chance as some miscreants may seek to use football universally accepted as a sport that fosters peace and harmony to create trouble. Good uh, organization, safe tournament. Um, originally we were supposed to be in Cameroon, um, very disappointed because it was in West Africa, now it's still Africa but North, <laughs> Egypt who has already good infrastructure probably uh, uh, will do well, uh, now it's just a security matter. No, but there's certain things that you cannot control because uh, it's, it's a long history about uh, the issue that uh, Egypt have, you know, towards the rest of the world. Uh, we had a small alert, you know, before the African Cup of Nations, you know, at the pyramid, there's yeah. been some, some issues. So I hope they will put, uh, like we had in, uh, in Russia, put enough, in, they have the example of Russia where it's been perfect, to put enough, you know, uh, intelligence, I would say, to control and block any person that wants to, to use sports to expose other matters. Sports is for sports. It's to diffuse a positive energy, not to try and bring political issue into it and, and, and make uh, innocent people into difficulties. So I hope it will be okay and they are doing everything to... So I'm going there also as a witness for that uh, and many more to, 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 to assure people that yes, Egypt is safe and let's go there and enjoy football again. He called on the organizers to ensure that all is done to protect the sanity of the game. All right, so that is it then. And of course, that concludes our sports here on News 360. My name is Thierry and thanks for doing the watching. Remember, we've got the coverage of the African Cup of Nations live right here on TV3 and affiliate stations. Keep watching. Right, so the Guinean showbiz circle is blessed with many young talents, but untimely death cut short the dreams of some of them. Today on Throwback Thursday, the spotlight is on Vibrant Fire. Born Imano Kojokwesin, Vibrant Fire came into mainstream music in 2011 under the management of an international dancehall promoter, Mr. Logic. With his unique style of delivery, Fire coined his own style of doing dancehall music, which he termed upper class dancehall, requiring dancehall songs to be done with the best of standards. His first hit single, Mampi, became like a national party song for music fans. <laughs> His other works such as Pretty Body, Budum Budum, Shatter Party got the ears of several award schemes which got him many prestigious nominations for 2014. The 29-year-old star who was getting to the peak of his career got involved in a fatal accident in 2016, but his works will forever live on. <laughs> And on that sad note, that's how we wrap up Entertainment News on News 360. There's more on 3news.com. And Miriam and Black, definitely proud. Have a good evening. You have a very good evening as well, uh, Miriam. My name is Parkwis Yassari. Thanks very much for watching. And I'm Natalie Ford. So lots more news on our website, 3news.com. I'm Black and proud. Have a lovely evening. I am too. Take care. <laughs>